Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to the Zetaco's virtual seminar series on mental flourishing, scientific and practical views on emotions and mind training. The series is organized by the Center for Bataan and GNH Studies in collaboration with the International Society for Bataan Studies. We are delighted to create a platform for debate and discourse on the exploration of different approaches and methods to mental flourishing. This is especially pertinent during a time when we are consistently faced with new challenges brought forth by the global pandemic. With numerous and old uncertainties that limit our ability to perform activities, taking the time to assess our mental health and well-being is more necessary than ever. From, for today's session, we are delighted to welcome three youth moderators, Chador Tse, Jirmei Chodin, and Sochum Chosen. Chador Tseung graduated from Sharpsi College in 2019 with a degree in life sciences. Jirmei is completing her degree in political science and sociology at the Royal Central College. Our youngest speaker, Sochum, is a recent graduate from Punaka Central School, where she studied arts with media. So it is with great pleasure for the CBS team and our esteemed audience to welcome Chador Jirmei Sochum and our keynote speaker, Professor Kim Samuel. The floor is yours, Chador. Good afternoon and welcome to the third session of Jachin first seminar series on my mental flourishing. This seminar series engages world-renowned actors and experts to share their research and insights into training the mind and emotion. Today we are delighted to be in conversation with Professor Kim Samuel. Professor Samuel has been working toward the vision of human connection and rootedness for the past two decades. She is the founder of the Samuel Center for Social Connectedness and an academic lecturer at institutions including Oxford, Harvard, and McGill universities. Professor Kim combines research, writing, teaching, and direct work to support communities in overcoming diverse social economic and environmental challenges in the 21st century. Through the Samuel Center for Social Connectedness, she directs research and programming in diverse areas, including education, global health, and indigenous reconciliation, sustainable development, forced migration, and inclusive architecture and place making. Thank you so much for you taking your time to share your thoughts with, and work with us. Professor Kim. <clears throat> the format of today's engagement is an interview. Afterwards, we'll share our own experiences and reflect on them with our guest. This will be followed by a short question and answer section. Participants may post questions in chat. Alternatively, those in the Zoom room may raise their electronic hands. Uh, now I will hand this seminar over to my colleague, Hilton Chosen. She will interview Kim. Thank you so much, Charles. I'm so looking forward to this conversation. Kim, you're a science of peers believer in belonging. Can you describe what social isolation is? What impact does it have on well-being? Good afternoon and good morning. Depending on where you are, I first want to say thank you uh, very much for this opportunity today and especially the opportunity of being able to give this seminar with three moderators who are themselves youth. Uh, so the real experts are, are the three of you uh, here today. And uh, thank you for helping me along. I also saw a, uh, a note from someone asking if people would put their video on if they were willing uh, to do that. I would also echo the request because in this virtual world, it, uh, it helps to see as many faces as uh, possible when you're speaking. So thank you very much. And now to the, uh, the first question, which is really what, what is this? What is social isolation? And, uh, and I'm also going to talk uh, a bit about the impact on happiness and, and mental health. As some of you may know, I uh, spent a couple of years as a visiting scholar with uh, Sabina Alkire and the team at OFI. And we were working together to look at what 
social isolation meant in relation to multidimensional poverty. And that had to begin with finding a definition of social isolation. And the one that, that we uh, used and I still use really can be stated in less than one sentence, which is the inadequate quality and quantity of social relations. It goes on with its relational component. This is relations, social relations with other people at the individual, the group, the community, and the larger social level. So in other words, it's the deprivation of social connectedness along with shame and humiliation. But for me, many years before that, that was uh, 2013 when I first went to, uh, to OFI and, and really in a way I've never left. But many, many years before that, uh, after my, <clears throat> my father had had a very serious brain injury and, and was recovering, I kept seeing in my mind's eye the image of a person who was sitting all alone at the bottom of a well. And if you could imagine physically what that might be like, um, I suppose it, it might appeal to someone, but for most of us, it would feel like being all alone. Bottom of a well sitting in the dark, bottom of a well is going to be cold and clammy and you would feel probably that you didn't really matter or might be out of all circles of concern. After all, why were you at the bottom of the well in the first place and why wasn't there anyone there to help you? And I really want to distinguish something here, which is that to sit alone at the bottom of a well or to feel socially isolated, it doesn't need in my view, to be measured by somebody else or even validated by somebody else in order for that to be real to you. It's enough to feel that because if you feel that, then that's the way you'll experience the world. I think it's also important to distinguish between loneliness and isolation. Whereas loneliness is a subjective condition particular to the individual, Social isolation and the inequality that spurs it is a structural, relational phenomenon and can affect many, many people together paradoxically at the same time. Social isolation breeds an environment that can negatively impact well being. When people have weak social connections, no one to turn to for support and a lack of resources at their disposal, they have less chance of maintaining good mental health, good physical health, good spiritual health. Studies show that youth with mental illness find it harder to form bonds and often feel more lonely. I'm going to uh, touch on mental health now uh, because I see this as so key and I'm going to focus on, uh, on youth um, because later I'm hoping that my fellow panelists might, uh, might share some, some insight on, on any of, of their, uh, their own observations in, in any of these related areas. Mental health and isolation deserves a lot more attention. Looking at youth, given the fact that suicide is the second leading cause of death for young people aged 15 to 29 years. In Canada, my country, between 15 and 25% of youth experience at least one mental health challenge or illness before they turn 19. And in Bhutan, a recent study found that nearly half of the 5,000 adolescents surveyed had a mental health challenge of some kind. I'll, uh, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much. I wonder if I could ask as a follow-up question, if you might describe what social connectedness and belonging mean. Thank you. I'll do my best. Social connectedness can be understood on a spectrum with social isolation. If social isolation is a deprivation in the quality and quantity of relationships, 
then social connectedness means we have adequate and meaningful relationships. I also want to add that in addition to social connectedness being vital to a strong mental health, mental flourishing, we also need to, to look at what this has to do with uh, gross national happiness, I believe, given, uh, given the, the setting and theme of this seminar today from Bhutan. I feel that gross national happiness and isolation are, are very, uh, very connected. And we see how overcoming social isolation goes hand in hand with happiness. And to me, this means recognizing that there is no other, that the other is only ever us, recognizing that we see ourselves in others and that we are all interconnected. If we build our political, economic, and social systems on the values and principles of belonging, then I believe we also advance happiness in all its forms. And this brings me back to social connectedness. Well, social connectedness remains a key concept at the heart of my work and that of my colleagues, uh, some of whom have kindly joined today, including uh, several of my former students who are now my colleagues. We see social connectedness as a very important concept, but also not the place to leave this meaning that belonging for me and for my colleagues encompasses four, we call the four Ps. They all begin with the letter P. Uh, we could choose different words, you could choose different words, but I'm going to tell them to you so that you can, you can see how intersectional this is. And the first is people. And that's a lot of what, what I've been talking about so far. But I wanna be clear that it's the individual, but it can also be groups of individuals that feel either very connected and that correlates with agency and choice or, or feel disconnected, which I've, I've already discussed, which is the, the lack of social connection. So now the holistic approach for me comes with the people. It also comes with place, that, that setting that can often be for people being in nature, feeling in harmony with that. It can be with power, which I, I interpret the word power as empowerment. And again, bringing in, being able to live with your rights and your choices, but, but even more so in relation to one another and to mother earth. And finally, to purpose, which, um, which is really about having a sense of purpose. And maybe that can be a sense of purpose for what you're doing today. This certainly is my, se my sense of purpose for today is to do a good job now, but also what our bigger sense of purpose is in our life. And I think if we don't have that, then I think it's very hard to feel connected and part of things. So belonging is, uh, belonging is the, the word that I, that I focus on. And I believe that we all have coming from social connectedness to the four Ps to what is uh, happiness, uh, gross national happiness is, is really a way of putting the right to belong in practice. I'll give you this example. By collecting household data that prioritizes belonging, not only to the economy, but to community, place, and, and in decision-making, Bhutan demonstrates that it's possible for national governments to implement sustainable and holistic development measures where a right to belong is upheld. Last summer, uh, I, uh, I had the honor of speaking with uh, Dasho Karma Ura, who, uh, who most of you will know is the director of the Center for, for Bhutan Studies. Uh, and we, we were discussing the, oh, we discussed many things actually, but, but the purpose of the discussion was to talk about social isolation, belonging and happiness. And Dasho shared with me that fulfillment and happiness are within the same family as loneliness and belonging. When you feel isolated, you feel alienated. He highlighted how important it is to measure this because fundamentally we would like to be socially integrated, connected and meaningfully related. 
the step toward holistic measurement is reflected in the GNHI. So I would also say that my, uh, my favorite shape in life for many reason, reasons is circles, including how I imagine belonging. Uh, bringing, bringing this theme here today, I think really is what's known as a full, a full circle moment because it all, it all comes back around the same circle. Well, I appreciate very much the questions about the definitions because that's where we start. I also want to say that, that even in my academic and scholarly work, I make sure that I have a definition and then move around and away from that because, because what we're talking about really brings in a lot of elements, including the spiritual, which is, which is hard to get at in, in traditional measurement frameworks. Thank you. So most studies have been revealing how young people internationally are one of the most isolated and lonely demographic groups. Why is this the case and what issues are you facing? Well, I thank you first very much for that insightful question and to say that, that I would turn to, I will answer it, but I will turn to the youth here, both the panelists and, and others that I that I see and know uh, here to, uh, to give more insight. I should also point out that for myself and for all of us at the Samuel Center for Social Connectedness, the maxim that, we, that we're guided by is, is with, not for. We never see ourselves doing work for others. It's always with. It's, it's, uh, it's this image that I can show you. You can see my hands, but it's it's holding, holding up our work with clear intention and honoring what we're doing, but really knowing that this space that we're working in is not a space that is our own domain, that it's really to hold the space for those whose domain that is, who are the real experts in the case of youth, it would be youth to create a safe space and, uh, and, a, and a scholarly place and a place with, with everyone being able to bring their own experience because of course we are all of equal value. But when you ask about, about youth in particular, uh, I can think of a, a, few, a few reasons why this is uh, one of the most uh, lonely and isolated groups. Youth today are living in an increasingly globalized and divided world. They, you, are feeling the pressure imposed by education institutions, where you're evaluated more often by numbers than by other important life skills and characteristics. Today's generation, and, and I would say yesterday's generation and, and the yesterday before that, where in my generation, we knew that, uh, when I should say with my generation at your age, at the age of youth, we, uh, we, knew that, we knew that there was bad pollution. We knew that species were going instinct, extinct, excuse me. Uh, we knew that people with asthma were having trouble breathing in places that had a lot of pollution. We then started to, to uh, see what was happening in the rest of the world from our corner and saw that it was the same. And one of the changes that gives me the most hope is how empowered the youth of today is. Not only can, can they speak up and make changes, they refuse. You refuse to be ignored or silenced or put in a corner or have your voice isolated, which is not to say that you have to carry the load for the rest of us. It's to say the rest of us can learn from you. Today's generation is facing climate anxiety, a term I hadn't heard until oh gosh, two or three years ago, as youth try to mend the damage caused by older generations and fight for a more just and sustainable future. Studies show that mental, that, that isolation can lead to depression, su suicidal ideation and other mental health conditions that will have a longer lasting impact on their lives than becoming physically sick. I've already uh, spoken a bit about mental health, so I won't go into too much uh, detail now but only, uh, only to, cite, uh, to cite that in, in Canada, the Canadian Association for Mental Health revealed that young people were more likely to experience depression and anxiety 
during COVID-19 more so than any other uh, demographic group by age. And I think when we talk about this, this term called long, long COVID for, for people that have had uh, COVID and, and have recurring uh, challenges is that I haven't seen so much that term long COVID and, and emphasis on the word long coming into mental health. And I think that has to be an area of very significant study and illumination. Well, mental health is being disclosed more openly though today, stigma is still a major impediment to accepting one's condition and see seeking help. This could apply to any age, but particularly in youth, there's a lot of uh, research about how social stigma can deepen one isolation, just as isolation can exacerbate stigma. This is a vicious circle yet again, that many lonely and isolated youth struggle with. I could give many examples, but in the interest of time, I'm, uh, I'm just going to give one more uh, and, then, and then a comment. The one more is unemployment. Uh, unemployment am among youth is, uh, is another global crisis. Employment, entrepreneurship, and income generating activities don't just provide economic benefits. As we know, they provide youth with a sense of purpose and belonging. However, today, according to the ILO, the International Labor Organization, there are more than 64 million unemployed youth worldwide and 145 million youth living in poverty. poverty. And I would imagine that the, uh, this is from 2020, so I would imagine that, that these numbers have only, only gone up in the last year. At that point, uh, the global, the global uh, youth unemployment rate uh, stood at 13.6%. As of 2019, Bhutan's youth unemployment rate was 10.7%. Many reasons have been attributed to this, notably a narrow labor market with a large proportion of the workforce still working in agriculture, not enough private sector growth, and a highly educated workforce that outpaced the supply of jobs. Unemployment at a young age can have negative long lasting impacts, not only in terms of future career, but also on one's confidence and on mental health. And, and I think as all of us on, uh, in this seminar know that in this, in this last uh, year and in some countries still counting, people haven't been able to go back to work, to school, to be, to be with others. And when we think about the, uh, the statistic I, I need, I need more sleep is, well, you're supposed to have eight hours of sleep. That's, we spend a third of our life sleeping and I'm focusing, okay, look at all the time we spend working or studying. And if we're not socially interacting with one another in meaningful dialogue and feeling and knowing that we're accomplishing something, imagine how, how damaging that is. I'll just uh, end on this point, which is that in terms of crises, young people, tend to be among the first to lose their jobs. And this sets up a structure of social isolation. That can be from poverty to food insecurity to a lack of social security systems that make meaningful employment all the more of a pressing policy issue. And I would be remiss without adding that uh, in addition to young people that women uh, at all ages have disproportionately been affected by unemployment uh, coming out of COVID-19. And the last is an observation, which is about social media. We cannot, we cannot underestimate the impact of technology and social on social and social media, pardon me, on, on youth today. I don't, uh, I'm not going to use this uh, forum to get into a discussion of the pros and cons of social media. I would imagine all of you could educate me on this very well. But what I do want to ask is for all of us that, uh, that are on today, and thank you for coming and please don't leave till we're done. <laughs> Wouldn't it be better, <laughs> please don't leave till we're done. Wouldn't it be better if we could be meeting in person or, or maybe a few of us could be meeting or maybe two of us could be together on this. And so when we're thinking about the hours that we spend uh, working or learning, 
let's uh, let's acknowledge that they're very high. How awful it is not to have them at all, but also it's pretty darn challenging to have them when you can't breathe the same air as another person and exchange energy with another person and even the informal things that come out of a stimulating talk. Uh, I'm not singling out this one. To not have that leaves me feeling very, very lonely. So let's think about what we could be doing when we're not on social media. Um, I think that might be a more positive way to focus than on how dependent we've all come lately. Thank you. During the pandemic, there have been a lot of programs to support young people and mental health here in town. Even today on DBS, there was an advert about young people that we are never alone and telling us to seek counseling or friends support if we feel sad. From your view, what should we keep in mind when it comes to promoting a sense of joyous belonging among the youth? Thank you very much uh, for the question and also for the, the insight, uh, sharing the insight that was uh, brought forward by BBC uh, today. And uh, perhaps I could, uh, I've got a few ideas to share, but I'd like to just address that first, which is, you know, to tell people that you're not alone is something that I do all the time in, and or to look a student in the eye and say, I believe in you because I completely do. And I don't want anyone to ever be alone. But, you know, we are alone and we're alone a lot of the time. Even the example I just I just gave on uh, on social media. But I don't think it's enough to simply acknowledge that because a lot of people maybe don't know that they're never alone, meaning what other connections that they have. And it, it may be in a spiritual way, it may be with nature, it, it, may, it may be with the ancestors, and it may be for this beautiful hour that we have together that we're all connected. So I don't, but I don't think it's enough to say that. And I think, I think it's also, and we hear this a lot, um, and BBC is not wrong, and to say, well, go out and make some friends, go out and reach out to other people. So easy, right? We all have options. Why don't you just go do it? And I, I really get a, a bit angry when I hear that kind of speak. Uh, not, uh, and I say, well-meaning article is that picture my person sitting alone at the bottom of a metaphorical well. You think a lot of people are going to be passing by to say hi? Oh, just a minute. No, just a minute. I'm sitting all alone at the bottom of the well, feeling really down right now. Don't think anyone loves me. Don't think I'm worthy of anyone's time. But hey, <laughs> let's go dance, right? I'm just going to hop right over and we can dance. It doesn't go like that. And so I advocate for all of us to be both caregivers and recipients of care. And when it comes to caregiving, it means being aware and reaching out to one another and knowing it's not enough to say, hey, just, just go out and do something, is that we have to be there and be there and be there. And that's what care means. Now, specifically to your question, I uh, believe we need more uh, data and investment in data. There isn't extensive data at a global level about mental health. And to me, this realizes uh, raises the question, what do we value? To me, that's a central question in everything. Answers can vary, but if we don't ask the question, then I, I think that as humanity, we've we've kind of fallen asleep. And maybe that's that's why we we we're stuck often in a in a in a circle that goes round and round and round and not a good one. <laughs> Without good data, we cannot fully understand the scope of the issues and allocate resources. And this is demonstrated by the fact that currently only 2% of health budgets globally, 2% are spent on mental health, despite one in four people, it's a quarter of the people in the world experiencing a mental health condition at some point in their lives. So following this point, one place we should invest more resources is in the education system, academic pressure, bullying, social media, and other factors such as, such as students being able to come back to school in a pandemic or teachers and students having 
to be trained in terror, terrorist uh, drills if their school is attacked. All of these undoubtedly exacerbate mental health at a young age and schools are key players to help set up youth for both overall success and mental flourishing. I would also uh, say that we need to support the whole, the whole student or if the young person is not in school, we, we support the whole young person, whether or not they're in school. But in schools, there's so much of the focus on achievement, on a measure that has to do with your grades. I, I have never seen any inconsistency in my teaching between caring for the students, seeing them as a whole person and high academic achievement. Um, there's several, several, uh, several people there here today that prove that point. I also uh, want to mention uh, social and emotional learning, which, which can bring mindfulness meditation into schools. It, it, it can bring uh, many different ways of, uh, of reaching out, but there's one above all, and that's how you are there for each other. No one can understand another young person or how they're feeling or have that trust in sharing than each other. And I feel that the rest of our job is to provide as many supports to that as we can, and we'll know what they are by listening to you. Thank you so much for the suggestion, Kim. Now, may I ask, can you share any programs and international examples that help combat social isolation and nurture a sense of belonging among young people? Well, I could probably name at least 100. <laughs> I won't do that. But my point is that I believe that there are many, many, many organizations that are doing, doing this, this work already. And most of them don't know it. And I believe that my job and that of my, my colleagues and our partners and collaborators is to really help illuminate this, this value about belonging, this, this attention to uh, happiness, this attention to working together, to caring about one another. I, I know, I'm well aware that today and whenever I speak, I'm not really telling telling anyone a uh, oh a new chemical formula to to make something that will do something amazing no my 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 uh, my concern really is to try to illuminate this value of belonging the uh, taking down of shame and stigma the building up of of our our relationships with each other and with the earth and I feel that I'm uh, hearkening back in some way to way before the alarm, the alarm clock was invented, what woke us up, who woke us up. I think that we all need uh, a bit of a wake up call to some of these things that, that are, are really in our, in our natural inclinations, but maybe we just forgot. But I'll still give you a few examples uh, and many more if anybody wants to reach out to me after uh, myself and my colleagues will be, uh, more than happy to, to give you lots of case uh, studies as well. But one is called City Year. City Year is in South Africa, where uh, as you would know, there is a high youth unemployment rate and under-resourced schools. City Year trains young people to be civic leaders and provides tutoring and after-school programming to children from low resource uh, schools and communities. And I think what's very important to stress about City Year, which, which operates in many other countries as well, uh, I, we're, a, we're a partner with this one, is, is that the youth leaders are people who have come from those communities that are very much underserved, so to speak. And, and again, they're going to know what the, uh, what, what the answers are and provide real peer support that can only come from someone who's gone through what you've gone through. The second example comes from Zimbabwe. This example is called the Friendship Bench. And the Friendship Bench was founded by Dr. Dixon Shabanda, a psychiatrist in Zimbabwe, a country that has, oh, slightly less than one psychiatrist for every million people. And he uh, came up with um, this great idea to involve 
grandmothers in in uh, in addressing mental health. You don't have to be an actual grandmother uh, to be a grandmother here, but what you what you will be is someone who has a lot of listening capacity and wisdom and time and is trained uh, in, in uh, peer reviewed pedagogical ways about how to provide mental health support to community members literally on a bench. And this takes away the stigma of it. If people need additional help after that, then they will receive it. But another feature is that everyone, even when they're on the bench for the first time, they, uh, they're part of a community circle that is with the grandmothers and with them, and they get together and identify problems in the community that need, need doing, need sorting out, and uh, where they can help, and the whole community is involved. And if you imagine what that's like, as opposed to the traditional, you're the doctor, you're the expert, you're the patient. And sometimes it's, you're the counselor, you're the victim. And I think it's very hard to bring around real healing in that, in that paradigm. And we now see uh, all these benches uh, appearing around, uh, around the world and, uh, and about an 18% uh, percent, uh, increase in uh, the French Invention Canada, 18% uh, increase in students coming forward to talk about their mental health on campuses where the Friendship Bench is installed. And the last I'll mention is uh, Taking It Global, which is an example from, uh, from Canada, but they're global as the name suggests. And Taking It Global was founded by uh, Jennifer Corriero, who, her who herself was uh, a youth at the time. Uh, and, uh, and, and she created this global platform for young people to connect with each other and to provide service and learning and sharing. And uh, what I love uh, about, about this is that they, they, uh, this work minimalize, minimizes social isolation uh, for, the, for the people who are part of it, but also with those who they work with. And, and one of our partners is, is called Connected North, which is bringing distance learning to, uh, to <coughs> excuse me, to Indigenous uh, students in the very uh, north remote parts of Canada, which has been especially key during COVID. And I talk about these three, these three principles of respect, recognition, and reciprocity, and how in community we have to have all of them, and taking it global from, from the way they work, to who they serve, to who they learn from, again, to who is in the center, who are considered the experts, I think that really embodies uh, embodies what I'm talking about. I'll, I'll stop there. This that could be an eight, an eight hour answer. There are many examples. Most of them don't know that they're already doing it. Thank you, Kim. What are the steps that young people can take to foster their own sense of belonging? Well, again, you'll you'll know more than me. But I'm, uh, and I want to, uh, I want to have some, and thank you for the question, but I want to have some time, I think everyone does, to hear, hear from the moderators and, and others today. So I'm going to, uh, to give this in, uh, in three short points. The first is to recognize the gifts you have and to understand how you can bring them forward within your community. And in doing this, the next one is you can also help peers to recognize their own gifts. Some people, I think, come into this world with more resilience than others. Uh, some come in with abilities or strengths in certain areas more than others. Some, have, some go through really harder experiences than others, although I don't think anyone could measure the significance of someone else's experience. But what, what we can all do is to recognize each other's gifts, especially if there's a time when we're not recognizing our own, someone can be there for us and vice versa. Uh, just parenthetically, that's why when I uh, saw the uh, Gross National Happiness Index that uh, 20, uh, 20, between 2010 and 2015, that uh, those reporting a very strong sense of belonging to their local community decreased by uh, 7%, which is, which is 
which is, uh, is disheartening and concerning and to me speaks to the consistencies with some of the, some of the other uh, metrics. Anyway, last, um, I would uh, say that we need to, and in no order, last could be first, we need to destigmatize mental health and we need to get a lot, a lot less, I think, my words, <laughs> hung up on whether someone has or may have a mental health diagnosis such as such as depression or whether what they have is just feeling very socially isolated because to me what you're experiencing is what that is to you and that sometimes labels such as mental health counselors lay people however we call it on the friendship bench as opposed to grandmothers that labels can can turn us into uh, into the other and I think that uh, well well that science is essential right science is essential to everything the art the art of caring for each other and seeing each other as a whole person uh, must never uh, never be allowed to diminish thanks Thank you so much, Kim, for the really moving and passionate answers. It really helps us to understand and articulate better our own experiences. Kim, we have asked you a lot of questions. Is there anything you would wish to ask us? Now that you mention it, yes. What I would like to ask my very articulate and brave panelists uh, is a couple of questions and they're inspired exactly from what you've asked me. I wondered if any one of you could please share what does belonging mean to you? It's the first question that I ask people when I uh, interview them. What does belonging mean to you? So would anyone uh, of the panelists be uh, kind enough to answer? Hi, Kim. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jeremy. Uh, I think that belonging to me is about affinity, feeling um, comfort and connectedness to a particular place, group, or person. Uh, for me, just being comfortable and being able to communicate and feeling affinity towards that is belonging. That's just a very vague answer. Thank you. Uh, would it, would anyone else, um, Shardor, uh, Sheltrum, like to answer that? And if not, it's okay, because I have another question. Okay, go ahead. So for me, belonging means the sense of acceptance. Um, so um, for one to belong to something or someone, we should have the sense of acceptance and um, I would just say we should accept someone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask uh, my next uh, question to Shador, which is, how have you been able to stay connected during the pandemic? And and I guess I, I would ask, uh, ask it in this way is that has it been has it been harder to to stay connected in the pandemic some of the things that i talked about was the isolation and loneliness that many people have felt and that includes students and i wondered if that if that sounds right <laughs> Okay. Um, I think I'll be answering this question. So okay. how have I stayed connected um, with people around me during the pandemic? So as for me, I was a border student uh, for the first lockdown that happened in Bhutan. So during that time, I connected with my friends really well because we were close to each other and we could see uh, each other face to face and we could communicate. Um, and we had lots of fun because we did not have to study, we just had to chill and then we could talk about the things uh, we weren't able to talk about before. 
and then as for my parents, uh, we had a handphone, a cell phone, from which we could call them every Friday. So I could stay connected with my parents uh, using that cell phone. And then during the second lockdown, I became a just college student. And then during that time, I connected with my friends through internet. Uh, they had the access to internet. So uh, we would chat sometimes online. And then with my parents, um, we used to watch movies together because we weren't allowed to go out. So yeah, that's how I yeah. spent my lockdown and we connected really well. Thank you. So it sounds like good, good, good with family, but missing, missing friends. Yes. That makes sense. <laughs> Um, would anyone else like to to uh, share how they've how they've been able to stay connected? And if not, uh, okay, good. And then I have one more question. Thank you. Um, uh, staying connected was not very difficult. Uh, it was a little bit strange to switch from um, going to class every day to online learning, and with that, we found it a bit of a struggle to sort of adjust to the whole. Um, idea of e-learning and also having to do everything on your own, being held accountable for your own time and work. Uh, that was with college. I, I still go to university here in Simple. So being like a 10 minute drive away from all my friends and my uh, lectures, but not being able to see them for months, it was a little bit um, sad, but technology got us, so we were fine. Uh, other than that, I, I was hosting a I was hosting a radio show during the lockdown. And um, I was doing that from home, but what I noticed was I could contact um, and connect with a lot of people from my community over Facebook and Instagram. And we could actually have conversations that we never had the time to have before. So the pandemic actually uh, brought a different dimension of staying connected I kind of introduced it to us. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Now, with my last question, I think what I'm going to do uh, is uh, is to open open this to uh, I would I would say anyone who's here, but I'd really like to uh, I'd really like to uh, receive uh, answers from from uh, other youth who are here and. Uh, Sam and Jess, I'm I'm happen to be looking at both of you right now. So maybe maybe one of you will uh, because you're both very uh, uh, very strong students in this field as well. And that is what what kind of supports should we be seeing from community and government and other purpose? Uh, excuse me, and other uh, other sources to to address social isolation, to build belonging, and and really to help each individual to achieve their purpose. And and I'm wondering if somebody might might uh, might answer that from the participants. Um. <laughs> If there is no one from the audience, I'll start and maybe somebody. The, the, yeah, and then I'd like, can I go, Sam, can we go to you? Mm. Okay, great. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, I'll just give you a context, um, I'll contextualize it to Bhutan. So during the pandemic, uh, as, as a youth, uh, I'd like to talk on behalf of the youth. The community and the government have really been supportive. So whether it be with education, um, with mental health as well, through media, there were a lot of platforms, there were a lot of people um, having active discussions. And um, also in terms of just, I think in terms of health, education, um, employment opportunities, and basically having a social network, a support system. Uh, Bhutan, I've lived here during the lockdowns and a lot of my friends as well have expressed that we have a very supportive community here and there have been so many initiatives where um, we have our, our needs have been met and um, we have been represented. Uh, the only thing that we find sort of, it's, it's only natural, but a sort of gap uh, that could probably be answered 
is the understanding of mental health and probably the stigmatization of it. Um, because mental health has been, it's a fairly new concept and um, it's only recently been talked about. And I think the youth that most probably go through uh, such kind of illnesses and struggles, uh, but uh, we find it a little bit difficult to kind of communicate with older members of the community and to kind of, um, we find ourselves in a position where we have to sometimes convince people that it's a real thing just because it's not physically, just because you can't see it or touch it, you know, and it's, it's because it's a new concept in Bhutan, but it doesn't mean it's going unaddressed. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that gives us, gives us a lot to, uh, a lot to think about. Thank you. Okay, who else would like to jump in? Sam, thank you. And then please introduce yourself and where you're studying or where you're from. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm from the United States, from rural Pennsylvania, um, but I'm studying right now at Oxford um, with the Center for International Development. Um, and I'm, I'm actually this summer going to be working as uh, one of the fellows at the, assignments, uh, the Samuel Center for Social Connectedness, which is very exciting. Um, I think this is a great question and I'm not gonna lie, I don't think I'm qualified to answer it. I don't think that any single person is. Um, but I think that the one thing that I can, I'm confident about is just a general understanding as I think we've, we've said already, um, not just in terms of mental health, but also um, many other of the, uh, the identities uh, that we assume. So I feel like, um, soon, I feel like communities are often you know, comprised of all these different people and all this very beautiful diversity. Um, but each of those identities often require a different mode of understanding, some sort of accommodations often. Um, and so I know, for example, again, I come from rural Pennsylvania, I come from cornfields, <laughs> essentially. And here at Oxford, it's a completely different world. And so I feel like it's easy to get lost in a place like this for someone like me. And so it's not just that people are able to ultimately join these varied communities, might it be a, a national level, a, um, a new university, a new place that you're moving to, um, but also sort of what happens once you're there. And I've been very lucky. I have a strong support system, um, but I, I know that not everyone has. Thanks, thanks, Sam. I think we're, we're either none of us experts or all of us experts. So I'm going to say all of us together. <laughs> we have to do this together. I'm going to uh, uh, officially transfer uh, to Jermaine now, who's who's uh, uh, moderating the uh, the, the uh, Q and A. But I just wanted to to make that to make that bridge. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Um, so now we are delighted to open the floor for a few further exchanges. Please put your questions or your reflections on your own experiences in the chat, or you can raise your electronic hand. Well, can I say something? Yes. Sure. Um, I wanted to comment um, on the on the top on the question uh, Professor Kim raised um, earlier about. What, 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 what we think the government or community should be doing to support us. Um, I, I think it's, it's a big, big, big question and, and I'm, I'm, in, I'm in no position to have an answer, but I think from her presentation, what I understood, she kind of touched on, on the question talking about investment. Uh, particularly in this case of COVID, we've seen how fragile our health systems are. And if, if there's one thing I would ask the government or the community is to mobilize enough investment, invest in health system and make sure that we have all the uh, adequate resources to support people who are struggling with mental health and also to, cre to create a um, safe environment for, um, you know, for all the people. 
for the people, to, for, for all the people, all races and cultures to find their own spaces within a greater community um, of any country or whatever that, that country is. So um, that's, that's my simple argument to, to answer the question. Um, we can move. I just wanted to make that comment before we move into the next, the next, uh, the next uh, section of the of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we still have the floor open for more questions. If there are any, you may send them in the chat box or raise your electronic hand. Yes, uh, we have a question here from Jess. Hi, um, thanks for having me here today. I, I really appreciate it. And um, I, I wanna, I, I have a question, but I also have just uh, something short to share with you today. So um, my name is Jessica Jess, and I, um, I was a fellow for the, for the, Samuel Center Social Connectedness Fellowship, um, which is amazing when uh, I had graduated from my degree. And um, just as uh, Samuel shared, uh, you know, I, I don't think that I can be alone in answering this question and not one person can do this alone, but I do hope um, that especially because I, I do work with youth that I, I could be there and I could be one of those people to help make that difference. And, um, I guess at, a, at an individual level, what I would say is that being there to support the teens one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's through um, individual interactions, walk, going for one-on-one -on -one walks with our masks or being online and having conversations with them, um, I think that checking in with them and following up on things that they specifically said and shared is what has helped um, the teens that I work with get through um, this process. Um, and that's where my question will come in in just a moment. But I think at higher levels, like Professor Samuel said, there's so many amazing initiatives that are happening already, um, hundreds that we can pull from. And so it's, I think, our job to advocate and to um, share with our governments these um, ideas and propose them and move them forward through programs that some of our governments are already running or community organizations are running um, here in in, where I am in Montreal, we have this program called the Federal Student Work Experience Program, and to implement some type of social um, aspect and a way for people to connect through the program um, while providing employment opportunities is just a, a method already in place that we can help um, put those ideas forward. But what I did want to ask is that, um, I guess, what are the challenges that uh, you as youth have had to overcome during this period of time and how have you overcome them? Um, just to make sure this was a question for the professor, but was it for us? For you as the panelist. Okay, okay great. Um, would any of the panelists like to answer it? Do you want to repeat the question? Would you like to repeat the question just so that um, all the panelists can hear you? Yeah, of course. And then I'll put it in the chat afterwards. So what is a challenge that you have had to overcome during this period of, I guess, even more extreme isolation during the pandemic? And how have you overcome it? Um, <laughs> I guess I'll be answering it while the other panelists talk about it. Yeah. Um, I think in Bhutan, it wasn't exactly I can't say I was really isolated as such because um, for me, I spent more time with my family than I did before the pandemic. And during the pandemic, I was more connected on social media uh, with people around me that I wouldn't have usually talked to before. So um, I, I didn't feel as isolated, uh, but I'm certain, Certain things did change, and um, not not being able to do a lot of things that you usually do, uh, it just kind of it struck us. And especially as youth, we started having bigger concerns. Um, so in Bhutan, it wasn't just being isolated, but also the fact that everything has been so steady, and 
you know, routine and it's been very comfortable till now. So being exposed to such a uh, kind of discomfort has kind of, um, I, I guess that's where the mental stress came from, not necessarily from isolation for me personally, just having to cope with and adjust to a new setting. Uh, it just kind of, I guess it makes, um, we were kind of made to deal with such a change, but, but not really told or maybe advised on how to handle it. So um, that was a little bit stressful, but also not being able to see each other every day was a little bit isolating, but uh, I think that we were well taken care of, especially for, I speak for myself, because the institution that I study in and all the people around me, everybody made extra efforts to make sure that we show um, social solidarity. So there was this constant, um, we were constantly told it's uh, not social distancing, it's physical distancing and social solidarity. And uh, I think isolation didn't have that much of an impact on me, but if the other speakers would like to express how they... Um, the challenge I faced during this pandemic, uh, it was mostly related with my studies. Since I was a student and the situation changed drastically, I wasn't able to cope up with it. and. I was really struggling to keep my focus on my studies and because we had such a long time uh, to spend uh, without studying, like we had to stay home, I could not uh, really focus on my studies when school began and I think my academic performances like uh, dropped down very drastically. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jess. I hope you've answered that question. Um, so that was a good question. Uh, so the floor is still open. If anybody else has any more questions, you may raise your hand or send it in the chat box for Professor as well as for the moderators. Uh, can I can I speak? Yes, yes. A, a completely unrelated, but I think I will uh, say something about uh, statistics during our lockdown. I think our moderators also are aware about it. Uh, three interesting piece of statistics came up during the lockdown. One, because of the uh, lockdown, your study uh, was switched off and uh, uh, as you said, the Bhutanese students were not so used to online as online. Uh, and so the Ministry of Education opened this sort of 24, no, 12 hours, uh, 12 hours call, um, 24 hours call centers, and they received a huge uh, sort of uh, calls asking them how to study online. <laughs> so that is thousands, actually about 1,000 cases, about 1,000 cases. So uh, that is a, a big change in Bhutan where teachers and students interacted by telephone. It's a big change. For the first time, Bhutanese uh, education system had to take uh, emergency steps on uh, teaching online. So that's one thing. For, so that's on your teaching. And uh, uh, I think uh, Professor Samuel might be interested to hear now two pieces of statistics on uh, sort of uh, rather um, disturbing side. Uh, one is uh, that uh, the, uh, the one is disturbing, others is a quite pleasing one. The disturbing side is that uh, about during the lockdown, I am uh, plus the time in between now, almost a year, almost a year now, the total uh, uh, call to the police 
uh, about uh, sort of uh, harassment uh, or some disagreements within the house uh, went up to about 200. Uh, nationally, that is not a lot, but uh, sort of uh, if you spread it across the year, it is not a lot for 700,000 people, but it's still still a sort of, uh, you know, how uh, when uh, disagreeable people have to stay together for too long, uh, you know, um, uh, that kind of uh, relational breakdowns can take place. I, I think we can read this as a minor relational break, breakdown. About 200, 200 cases like this came up. Uh, on the pleasant side, uh, uh, police, uh, of course, had uh, greater duty of policing, but uh, the uh, um, sort of uh, uh, theft, minor theft usually in Bhutan, uh, accidents, then uh, sort of break-in, etc., uh, completely went down this year, whole year. There was a, a very big change in the crime statistics in Bhutan. Thank you. Thank you, Latasho. Um, before we proceed to the final part of the event, which is the vote of thanks, we have one question for Professor Kim. Um, I'll just read it out to you. Uh, it says, Kim, we seem to presume that isolation has increased during lockdown, but we also heard from the panel that maybe people had time to be with you be with each other and to talk about things they didn't have time to discuss before. I wonder if the Samuel Center is also profiling positive ways that people are deepening social connectedness during this pandemic and how it might affect our priorities afterwards. Thank you very much for, the, for that question. The answer is, is yes. You, you, talked about this with your with your family yeah there's uh, many many individuals uh, and families and groups that that really made the most of this of this time I don't I, I wouldn't confine that to lockdown because even if people weren't in lockdown at a given time there there was a lot of other things going on not the least of which were, a lot of people getting very sick or dying from uh, from the virus, and I guess it would be easy in one way to say, well, it just depends. You know, it just depends on your situation. If you have a good a family and and get that that's has good relationships and and you reasonably don't mind being with each other a lot more of the time, then that's that's great. Notwithstanding, a lot of people don't have that but you still want to be able to have your freedom back to move around uh, again or to go to school and to engage in your life. But I think we all, all know that. So in terms of where does the center come in? And I take that to mean, so what can, be, what can we learn? I think what you're really asking is what can we learn? And I think what we can learn is to work on these things before there's a crisis mm -hmm. to work on our relationships to look who literally is standing at the back of the room that nobody's talking to, to look at institutions that really, we, we would say ideally don't exist at all. I mean, such as long-term care um, institutions for people that are, that are older. Uh, we know that everyone has the right to, uh, to live in, in community and, and the choices of where they want to live. And we look at all of the, 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 uh, the deaths uh, substantially higher than anyone else, anywhere else it's, that have taken place in uh, long-term care homes and affecting older people. Will I come and ask why, why was that? Did all the problems that leading to all of this happen because of COVID? No, they did not. They were all ready there. We, we look at incarcerated uh, people. And just uh, this morning, I was reading, I think it was in the New York Times uh, headlines of the day uh, about uh, 
people that are incarcerated and the astronomical rates of COVID is, is the policy assumption that people, older people in institutions or, or uh, incarcerated people in prisons or any other group has, uh, has a much higher chance of contracting uh, COVID because of that, or is it because of that, and somehow they are being valued differently, it's considered permissible for them to live in places that they can't come and go uh, on their own, that they don't have enough care, that the quality of the food isn't good. And, and I'm not saying that's true of everywhere, but I'm just giving you an example. If, if, if when systems are structured around the individual, around the person, um, we, and we view all people of, as equal value, everyone born with this inalienable right of belonging, as I describe it, then I think we're a lot less likely to see the catastrophic effects that we have. So what do we need to learn? Yes, we need, we need to change our behavior. Uh, only that as a species, only that. We need to change our behavior in the way uh, we interact with or respect and live in harmony with the environment. We know, we know that the link uh, the link with uh, global warming and, uh, and, and pandemics. And we know there'll be more, but at the center for social connectedness, what can, what, what can we reasonably do in, in, a, in a way of being one point of millions of points of light is that we can go back to what was happening before that crisis happening. And, and uh, Dasho Karmaura, thank you very much for sharing those uh, statistics uh, with me, with all of us. My question when I was hearing about the, the, the first one about, uh, I guess what I would call, in my vernacular would call domestic ab abuse. What, what were the conditions? I mean, a lot of people maybe don't wanna be with their partner 24 hours a day, but it doesn't mean that when you are, that you have a right to um, abuse them mentally or physically. And we know uh, that, uh, that they, these incidences were reported, reported all around the world and were affecting women much more than men. So what's happening in terms of the inequality and what's considered permissible or not permissible at a time when there's not a global pandemic that then when there is, when there's a crisis, and uh, COVID-19 uh, is one of many crises that we're, that, uh, that we're, that we're facing as a planet uh, now is, is what, what were the differences in how people were valued, uh, treated, respected, uh, understanding how to connect, having people to give them support if they weren't before that. Uh, when it's not a crisis, I just noticed there seemed to be a lot more fewer people that wanna be uh, involved uh, say, well, there's something more urgent, something. I think the things that we think of that, that aren't urgent, if we focus more on those, such as relationships, uh, such as measuring happiness, such as what it means to belong and seeing that and feeling a responsibility, not only for yourself, but for others, all of that seems to go in this category of that soft. Well, I don't care if it's called soft or hard. For me, that's the center of the circle. And that's where our attention needs to go. Thank you, Professor. That was very insightful. And uh, I think we could all really resonate with that thought. Um, I'd like to bring this very fruitful event to an end with a vote of thanks. Uh, but before that, uh, did Dr. Ladasho, did you have anything to respond or add on to what Professor had said last. No, I, I think uh, Professor uh, Kim asked one uh, uh, direct question. This, uh, what happened? Uh, why did things go up? Uh, uh, she called domestic abuse. Mm, uh, uh, no clear um, before and during uh, before the lockdown and uh, during the lockdown, comparison is possible. Uh, but uh, I have one, well, l let me share one anecdote and then one tentative answer to your question. Uh, the, uh, uh, my driver, uh, 
all of us were uh, not prepared for lockdown. It just was announced. And so we were all caught um, without, we were immobilized the next day. I mean, it was announced at night. So we were uh, we put up in our own houses for, you know, X number of days. So uh, in the case of uh, my, uh, my driver or my friend driver, he told me that he received a few days ago, uh, 11 guests from his village heading towards uh, uh, another part of Bhutan and stopping by in Thimpu in his house. So when they woke up next day, uh, they could not continue their journey. And so they remained in his house for some 21 days, 11 of them, you know, uh, and uh, I, you can then deduce from there that his house must have become overutilized and that might have created some strain on him and his wife and children and caused some uh, sort of uh, uh, suppressed uh, difficulty how to accommodate so many people. So that's the anecdote. And within that uh, context, you can imagine that the wife and husband can um, quarrel depending on their attitude. Um, I cannot explain for all the uh, quarrels within the family during the lockdown time, but uh, um, you know there is a, a good amount of uh, drinks being taken by the Buddhists, uh, especially men. And uh, I think it is good for them to go outside and drink. Uh, but during the lockdown, lock time, lock, lock, lockdown, I think they may have taken the drinks in their household. And then the you know, aftermath, you can imagine. So, you know, so sort of, uh, uh, sometimes it's good to have bars outside but not the run your house as the bar. You know, so uh, I, 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 I imagine maybe 20% 20, 20 of uh, cases may be related to alcohol. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Now I'd like to uh, bring this very fruitful and insightful session to an end with the vote of thanks. We are truly grateful to Professor Kim Samuel for her wonderful insight and expertise into the right to belong, which counters feelings of isolation. As youths, we tend to feel that we suffer from these emotions the most severely. This session has given us the opportunity to unpack these feelings, which has been incredibly wonderful. We are particularly grateful that she tailored her remarks to our distinctive context as a small yet geopolitically strategic GNH country in the Himalayas. We are grateful for your time, for this human and professional connection to you, for our interchange, and for the wonderful new insights you contributed to this seminar series on the scientific and practical views on mental flourishing. May I remind our audience that these seminars will continue over the next two months. Thanks to the leadership of Dasho Karmaura and the Center for Bhutan and GNH Studies. Our next seminar is next Thursday, 13th May at 2 p.m., where Dasho Tsring Topge, former Prime Minister of Bhutan, will interview Professor Nairi Woods, Dean of Oxford's Blavatnik School of Government on Values and Technology in Government. Our next seminar on mental flourishing is in two weeks, on 21st May at 4 p.m., with Professor Barbara Fredrickson, world expert on love 2.0 and positive emotions. Please do register for this and the following seminars on the links found on CBS Facebook or website or via Instagram. Once again, we are extremely grateful to have this wonderful connection with Professor Kim Samuel. I'm confident that our audience found resonance with much of what we discussed today and hopefully this is only the beginning to our journey to understanding ourselves and how we belong. Thank you. Can I say a short thank you? 
right. Thank you. Uh, thank you to every everyone. Uh, thank you to Dasho Kamora and thank you to Sabina Alkire and thank you to the wonderful team at uh, CBS and especially to my uh, fellow panelists and, and those of you I know in, in Canada who, who joined at uh, six o'clock in the morning. I'll never forget that. Uh, it's been wonderful for me to be able to share what I know, but even more to be able to uh, to learn from all of you. And I really hope I get to come to Bhutan someday soon. Thank you.